How to know who you should go into business with. What values should align? How long of a commitment should people be willing to make? Whoa. Okay. Let's go there. Hello, and you are listening to the Valor Coffee Podcast. Valor Coffee Podcast is a weekly podcast that myself, my business partners, Ethan and Riley of Valor Coffee, sit down to talk about the coffee industry, leadership, coffee itself, and different lessons that we've learned along the way of building our business. This week, we compiled a good bit of questions that were backlogged, and I love answering questions on the program because we're here in our warehouse just talking on a podcast, and we can't see any of you you. And so whenever you send in questions, it gives us a great opportunity to connect with you, answer your questions, obviously, and just continue an actual relationship that is so beneficial and refreshing and rewarding for what we're doing. We covered a few really awesome topics like how do you know who to go into business with? What should your values be? And whenever the three of us are disagreeing on something in our company, how do we debate that? And how do we decide what perspective we go with? Is it unanimous? Is it not unanimous? It was a great time. We also reviewed one of our favorite coffees that we've ever had on the program. It's a coffee from Ecuador, roasted by Little Wolf, and it is going to be one for the books. If you'd like to support the program and help us continue to do this, we have a partnership going with Clive Coffee, which is an online retailer of coffee gear. And if you use code VALOR5 at checkout, you get 5% off Eureka Grinders and Luca Espresso Machines, which are really great espresso machines, especially for coffee carts out there. So if you want a little kickback for the program and also have a discount code that can help you with your budget, when you're starting out, use Valor 5 at checkout to get that 5% discount. Without further ado, let's get to the program. Hear ye, hear ye. Welcome to this time, guys. I'm so excited to dwell in unity with you both. You just mic dropped with the coffee you brought in today, didn't you? You've been talking about it all week. Where'd you get that coffee? I can't stop talking about this coffee. It's true. Affiliate link below. <laughs> Code Ethan at checkout. <laughs> I'm kidding. You Mel- Melissa, you guys got affiliate links? Yeah, come on. Uh, I went to Meadowlark for the second time. I had to go visit after having JP on the program. <laughs> Did you just go for a little trip? or That what, sounds what was more intentional. Occasion? No, I was on my way to North Carolina Okay, for okay. a little guy's getaway. Nice. Uh, and me and my friend Zion. You guys know Zion? Yep. Mm-hmm. Uh, we popped in and JP gave me this for free. I think if anyone goes... I think he's just handing out stuff for free. Yeah, I think if you go, he'll just give you something for free. Yeah, so, just so. use code Ethan. Use code Ethan <laughs> 100% check off out. your order. <laughs> say, uh, say, uh, say Ethan sent you. And Ethan gets kickback on the free product. Yeah. Man, thank JP, thank you. It's the, Wow. It's all about brand exposure. You know, I'm like, dude, do you know what kind of exposure you're going to get yeah. for this? Um, Y'all really do be drinking all the coffee. Yo, you're you just, finished you the speed up, bud. I got one sip of the espresso. I got one sip of the espresso. And that was Same my here. first sip of the cappuccino, and that's how much is in it right now. I took I get the spit. One, this dude. All right, he, I know. He, what do you want to drink? The, the espresso. He drank the dial in too. What do you want us to say to you? Hey, buddy, make sure you drink your drink. I want you to leave some for me, and I want you to say you're sorry, and I want at least an extra three percent equity because of this. It's kind of the least you could do. We were just talking about how equity doesn't mean anything. I'm going to finish this. <laughs> equity doesn't mean anything. Tune into our next podcast. <laughs> oh, hey, we'll get to this coffee later, but man, it's awesome. Did Ross mess up the pour over? Yes. yes. <laughs> Do you even know how? Yeah, how'd you mess it up? Do you think it was too fine? I think it was too fine. Then I messed up. It just I told it him. just was clogging really early on, and that could have been on me, or it could have been the the... However, but that espresso was one of the the more memorable and uh, me- memorable espressos I've had in a while. Can can we just? I know we're gonna talk about it later, but why are there five varietals? Why are there five varieties of coffee? This is just like a huge co op in Ecuador. Well, we'd have to look into it. Oh, could be the same farm, multiple varieties. Yeah, there's a couple different. I just don't usually see that many varieties on a label. It's it's pretty typical. <laughs> Cut, wrap. Hey, what's a variety? Well, Ethan, I'm so glad that I can help you with this. You know how you might have different types of grapes? Table grapes? Give me another. You cotton ain't, candy. You ain't grapes. Cotton candy yeah. grape. Give me a different grape. Come on. Red you, grape. You, you know some Muscadine. Scuppernong. 
<laughs> Nung. Uh, yeah. So Fair just brand. like that, we have different coffees. It makes, and so those coffees taste and have different characteristics. I love that. I need to, we need to do a deep dive on the, the impact of varietals, you know, like different varieties of coffee grown at the same farm. I, I love talking about and researching something that we previously didn't know a ton about because in teaching, we're educating ourselves. Yes. And that's how I learn the most is by externalizing what I'm learning. Yeah, because so, we, we never want to be just like spouting out BS, which we've like, never I mean, done no. sometimes, before, ever. Sometimes no. a little bit. Or just sharing like exactly 100% of what we know. But it's like just enough to get by. You know what I mean? Yeah, I don't know anything like, about Like that. you say like just enough about varietals to be like, yeah, they're, they're just different. And you're like, okay. Hey, while Ross pulls up this week's Q&A section, because he's been talking about it all morning, we do have. Some I have to fire. tell you guys something. I bought a flare manual espresso machine, bro. Sheesh. And we're gonna use them in the cafes. <laughs> yeah, we're getting rid of everything else. We're going zero carbon footprint. I did see in my research of recipes that there is an intelligentsia cafe out there that uses a flare. Not just exclusively oh. that, <laughs> but I think. Like as probably as like you got to pay extra for a flare shot. I, I would assume so. That would make Just sense. It, it's harder to do. Yeah. Have you used it yet? No, I got it last night. I you didn't use it yet. <laughs> I don't have a grinder for it yet. I had to sell my previous grinder. Did you get a new one? I had to. Mm-hmm. Is it a single dose? Mm-hmm. DF sixty four. Ever heard do of you it? Think, no. Do you think single dose grinders at home are just like the new norm? Oh yeah. Because it because you can invest more money in the grinder itself and less money in whatever else you would invest in. I mean, it's just I, one of the big things is like usually your counter is underneath a cabinet above, so like they the hopper they took away yeah. the hopper, so that is one big part of it. But like in most instances, especially with these newer grinders that are uh, flat burrs, and since you can manipulate other things like flow control if you're really diving into this super hard if you have like a lelite bianca or like a flare uh where you can do like pressure profiling Mm. you you have other like variables you can manipulate to for the dial-in process yeah so you can really easily dial in a coffee with like only wasting a shot or so sure it's a lot easier than it used to be at least yeah yeah, but all all new grinders, like home grinders that are coming out, are single dose. There's a couple like Eureka has some with hoppers, mm-hmm. uh, affiliate link below. Uh, but literally, <laughs> if you get it on uh, Clive Coffee, yeah, Valor Five, yeah, well, baby. Discount. Yeah, well, it makes sense because you want to be able to use your grinder for espresso or pour over. Yeah, so it's just like two birds, one stone. That's why we have an EK. Yeah, even that. Someone was asking if we knew anyone selling an EK, and I kind of want to sell that EK and get a Weber EG1 for in here. That's not a bad idea. Yeah. Sell that EK mm-hmm. and get something more techy. Yeah. Something you, you guys more, know the EG1? Yeah, something more breakable and yeah. stuff. Yeah, totally. The EG1, I don't think, is that breakable. Yeah. it's That's it's, the one that looks like a spaceship. Yeah. The machining and stuff on it is insane. And yeah. the coolest part about it to me is that at the bottom there's like a magnetic clip that you like pull apart the magnets and the burrs are instantly exposed mm. oh, nice. so it's all toolless and even the burrs like the burrs don't have screws they're held in by pins on the back and magnets so that sounds bad but it's not it's i mean not bad. in practice it's, it's actually good it's fine and it actually is good you want to know why why um because it's weird to actually have screws as a part of your burrs yes that makes sense because then you don't have like a symmetrical burr like at some points the burr the bean is able to go through the entire process of the burr and then at other points it's not okay look weber really hurt my feelings with the moonraker is it the same weber yeah yeah i was thinking the same thing but they really made me happy with their grills (laughs) what i'm kidding it's another brand i I love grill jokes dude they okay. also have the uh, 
the bird oh, the, thing we were looking at. The bird brewer, the reverse French press. Look, that, 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 that looks, looks cool. We've yeah. got to try it. Agitation, Dude, French they're so press, expensive. Well, they'll send it to us. We're Guys, if you, can, if you can all just spam Weber, begging them to send us a bird. So, we've we talked so much on crap on Weber. We have. It's so funny. It's not, it's not talking it's crap. Not. It's feedback. You're right. You're right. Yeah. Feedback that they need for Moonraker version two. And if you guys right. listen to the podcast with me and Lillaby, we talked about we give feedback to the people we love because yeah. we want to see them improve. We love you, Weber. Someone right. commented on my Moonraker video, or it, maybe it was my autocomb video where I like Don't plug your own channel, bro. Don't <laughs> plug your own channel on the pod. Somebody commented and said, You must have Parkinson's if your Moonraker looks like that to me. Dude. And I was like, it's not even me. What it's if you two did? different cafes. You and said, what if I did? He said, bro, leave Parkinson's out of this. No joke. It was, that was a really weird. rude comment. Yeah. And now people, you're, you're, you're getting off. You're not making videos anymore. Yeah, people no videos. stay saying rude things on the internet. Anyways, let's move on to this week's Q&A segment. Brought to you by? Brought to you by Jonathan Bay. <laughs> B-A-E, baby. Let's go. Um, Come on, baby. So I think we'll probably hit two questions depending on how long we go on this. Jonathan Bay we got all day. <laughs> right. Says, hi, I'm a listener from Seattle, Washington. I believe yes. I heard in the past that as the owners of Valor, you all will not move forward on a business decision unless all three are in agreement. Have there been any compromises to this decision or this arrangement? For example, if there's two people for one and one against, I feel like there would be pressure on the one person who's not in agreement to give in for the sake of time or not wanting to start a debate and argument. I think having all members in agreement is a great sentiment, but difficult in practice. Johnny. Dude, stay out of our personal life, Jonathan. Jeez. That no, is kidding. such Welcome. a great question. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> it probably comes from episode that we talked about operating agreements. And I remember early on, we went with the, uh, the majority rules arrangement. Is that, is that right? And then we changed to unanimous. I don't remember that, but I just remember that we do unanimous. I thought I remember that because even when we did majority rules, we just like didn't like how it felt. And we were like, we can usually just. So, so one thing that caught my attention and what he said is like, uh, the reason that would be difficult to do unanimous is for two reasons. One of them would be the person that disagrees could just stall almost as a tactic to get their way. Right. Filibuster. Filibuster. And then the second thing was to avoid a debate or argument. So let, I'll address that second one first. Like, we want to debate and argue. We do it those every are, week. Those are two different things. In the ring. De you know, argument, I think that can sort of have a connotation of like we're disrespecting one another, and that's never what we want to do. But debate, if we can't debate, then why do we have business partners? Yeah. And debate is is merely just the exchange, the respectful exchange of two different perspectives. And when we all have shared values at, at our core, which that's the reason why we have core values, we're going to come at those values from a different, ah, the spirit. She's speaking. We got, we got a new espresso machine back here. A yeah. new old espresso I machine. I bet you can't even hear it on the pod. I can't even hear that. <laughs> Uh, but we have the shared values. We we come at we come at those values from different places, and we also have different strengths and weaknesses that we speak from. And so we've gotten better over the years at being able to debate for as long as we have to, so to where we all get on the same page. Um, so we never want to avoid debate because that that's literally why we have business partners. Yeah. Most recently, I can think, you know, full transparency here. That's why we're on this. Well, that's why we had this podcast. Me and Ethan were at a disagreement about something in our owners meeting on Thursday. And so, all right, we'll, we'll, just, we'll just say what it was. Uh, I kind of want to do mobile ordering in our Dunwoody location because it's a much lower foot traffic area. And Ethan has experienced mobile ordering at Alpharetta and the downsides of it. So we had probably 30 minutes of back and forth and Ross is kind of like in the middle, maybe leaning towards, he might be leaning towards me. Ah, he's on my side. Uh, but <laughs> with have, that, I was leaning towards you in, in the meeting and then we talked afterwards. I was like, Hey, I got you. 
<laughs> this, this is what healthy relationships look like. Go ahead, Bradley. And we didn't come to an agreement on that in that meeting and nothing happened because I want to do something. Maybe Ross even wants to do it. Ethan didn't want to do it. We're not going to do it right now, especially considering Ethan is like the leader of our retail operation and it's not going to destroy our company. And so that that's expressing his first reason why it might be difficult mm -hmm. is like, and I remember we talked about this whenever we set all this up, like what happens whenever the, the issue in question is a do it or not do it question? Because that's not always the question. But in this case, it is. The, it's do we do mobile ordering or do we not do it? Mm -hmm. And you're playing the role of filibuster here, you know, but there's a, there's a shared respect. There's assuming the best of each other. I, I think respect is really at the core of what it is. And mm -hmm. like desire for the common good is really deep down at the core mm -hmm. because whenever you're arguing your point for your own selfish reasons, like for you individually or to have so that you don't have to work as much or so that, you know, it's less hard for you or whatever it is that really starts to break down and you can really sniff that out. Like whenever you're having a debate with someone, but whenever like in that debate on Thursday, I never heard any of that between you guys. I all, I just heard like, we both want the good of this company and the good of this company. We both think that's the same thing. And that's our vision. So mm -hmm. we're always moving towards our vision. Top 1% of coffees in the world, top 1% of hospitality in the world. How can we do that with mobile ordering? And what I really respect about how you approach that, Ethan, is you were skeptical of it and still are, and that's fine, but you did your best to understand his point. And if you, and you did your best to understand his point. And so like, if we're debating, but we don't even understand what each other are saying, then we're just spinning our wheels. Mm -hmm. So I feel like this question is a great question, but it's really a surface level question if you are able to have some of these other things that we're talking about, like trust, mutual respect, aligned vision, aligned values, history together, that stuff, then it's not easy, but it's effective. Yeah. I think that's a really good way to put it. It's, it's like if Ethan, you know, in our conversations and in our debates, if Ethan can prove to me that his point is what's best for the company, I would be an, a prideful idiot to not like mm. go with his suggestion Yep, and vice versa. Of course, of course. Ethan, you got any thoughts? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was thinking just in our eight years of making decisions together, um, I feel like the like quote unquote debate usually comes in like lower tier categories, right? Like this isn't like make or break the company. And that's, I feel like we feel like very comfortable in that space to explore and like express, but when it's those really like crunch time, like big deal decisions, because there's so much respect and value on each other. Like if there's not majority or if there's not a hundred percent buying, it's just like a non-starter to start like really debating or we're just, we just don't have debate. Yeah. Or frankly, we're just really aligned about like, you know, do we want to do this Dunwoody thing? Like, do we want to open a cafe in Dunwoody? Like we didn't have one of us that was like, I don't want to do this. Don't make me do this. And we're like, dude, yes, you see all these positives. You have to do it. But like we, we made that decision before we like started that journey, you know, or, um, I'm thinking like when at the top of the year, we're doing a lot more budgeting, right? Like all of us had just had the main line vision of like, we have to be sustainable. And so when we're talking about what to cut and what to keep, it's like, there's some expression of like, yeah, take this off or yeah, let's try to do this. But there's such a deeper longing for us to feel connected and like the, the overall vision being executed. It's not like, I feel like we were really quick to drop what our, we think is a good idea, you know? Yeah. Because we we're able to separate ourselves from it. It's like, oh yeah, let's cut the origin trip. And someone's like, we really need to go on this. It's like, okay, if you, yeah. <laughs> we can get back to it. Yeah. It's, there's just so much built into the core values and philosophy of our company that it's like, there's not going to be any debate of if someone comes to us and says, Hey, 
We've got this space, downtown Dawsonville, $48 a square foot. <laughs> Clearly, we can look at that situation and be aligned on it instantly. Um, I guess that we were doing it. Yeah, that, we, yep, that, that we're in. Okay, yeah. so next question. Sorry, did you have another thought on that? No, I One saw that was a really good succinct way to put it. It's like we're not putting ourselves against each other. It's always like the lens of valor and understanding what's best for valor. Oh, yeah. And then we go from there. And thankfully, it's pretty rare that like a big decision, we don't agree on what's best for valor. And one more thing to say really mm -hmm. quickly. I think some people starting a business, their their worries about debates and uh, like having to come to each other. A lot of times it's like approval for a purchase, mm. which is like a big thing when you're first starting out. It's like you got to like really talk about whether you need this $200 thing. Mm. As you move along in your company, that number realistically just kind of goes up and then you aren't really like super worried about that. Sure. I think there might be a thing between us or in our, in our operating group is probably way lower, but like at this point, I don't think Ethan tells me about a purchase unless it's like $10,000 worth of custom cups. And it's just like, this is about to happen. Hmm. It's not really even like a can I? It's like well, you kind of need it. It's this like we, it's just something we got to do. So yeah, uh, that is something not on my mind. Like if I maybe if I like sold the EK and you came in and there is a Weber EG one mm. sitting there, you'd the be like, what the hell? Yeah. But anyways, yeah, I I just really admire both of you, and I I think the way that you guys, the way that you're wired and the way that you think is so entertaining to me and like it's a movie it's kind of like a movie you just sit back and <clears throat> and laugh it's like no, a it's, rom-com it's cool and i think about how uh like the older you get the more cautious you should be before you go into business with someone because mm. you're both and it's the sim same way with marriage uh <laughs> No, let, go let, there, let, me, <laughs> let, let me just finish my point, okay? We're on a long-form podcast. Nobody clip this up and take it out of context. Okay, ready, go. I'll speak from my experience. That's, that's always safe. For me, <laughs> we, I went into business uh, with two goons when I was like 19, 19 years old. I also got engaged at 19 years old and married right when we turned 20. I was such a unformed, green individual but I had a good heart and I, I was a good, good dude. It's just, I was very immature in so many ways. And so the people around me really formed me is my point. And I formed them, right guys? Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. No way. <laughs> and so, uh, I think that like where I'm at now, my marriage with my wife and with you guys, because business partners is kind of like marriage is we've really worked it out over the years is what I'm saying. And we've really like kind of grown up together. And so we've learned so many lessons along the way and we've really like fit into puzzle pieces of a, of a puzzle, you know, fit together. Mm -hmm. But whenever you're older, you're already such an established whole person in some sense. You're brittle. That like, it's harder to just go into business with someone. It's hard to like commit the rest of your life to someone in marriage because you have all these dreams and aspirations of where you want to go. You have all these really strong values that you hold dear to yourself and you don't want to compromise on at all, which that's a really good thing. Whereas back then it's like, I didn't have any of that. And I'm like, I'm just seeing where this goes. So my point there is like, it's, we've, we have these shared values, shared vision, but that's come over a lot of years. Mm -hmm. And so be careful with who you go into business with is my point. But the next question from a good friend of the program, and wholesale partner of Numa Coffee, Nathan Hanna. Oh, Nathan, how are you? I don't know. Uh, um, Wait, so, still waiting on a shirt, Nathan. But <laughs> he actually he addresses that in the email. Do you want to really? hear? Really? Yeah. So he's like, Ethan. Funny that you made the comment about sixty dollar <laughs> t shirts in the last episode, cause, well, let's just say I got y'all shirt sizes for a reason. My yeah. jaw's on the floor. Is it gonna be Gucci? You think? Prada. I hope so. Uh, so he sent several questions. I'll highlight one of them. Um, if you were to open a cafe with a completely different service model than the two that you have, what would you want it to be like? Aesthetic, menu, volume, equipment, service flow, that sort of thing. Dream about it as if whatever you did would thrive. Oh, 
Hmm. What could and should be, you might say. <laughs> Ooh, okay. Man. Okay, I'll, right off the bat, I'll say one of them. You're saying what we're all thinking. That, uh, that we've t- talked about over the years. I think this was our good buddies, Kent. Kent's idea. Kent of Don't give him that, dude. It was my idea. We Kent's, talked about Kent's it. Kent's been getting under my skin. I want to give credit where credit's due. And Kent, I cannot wait for you to move to town. We love you, bro. Can't wait to get you on the program. We're thinking about you every so, day. Really, this is uh, sort of in line with our vision of like excellence, empathy, these sort of, this sort of balance. But you have one part of the cafe that is a sit-down, uh, slower, more intensive experience that maybe even has table service. And you've got, I was going to say a mod bar, but the mod bar is not even doing that well for us. Whatever, like a really cool maybe like Mavon. a uh, Mavon. A, a a decent maybe a decent where you're doing this crazy pressure profiling or three decents beside each other whatever it is and you're doing some a different style of coffee that's you know maybe more modern maybe even like this uh, ecuador with five varietals in it something like that where it's more progressive coffee focused education that sort of vibe so that's one side of the cafe and the other side of the cafe is like a different color almost like or a different design. Mm. And there is an Eversys or two cameo and you're just slinging to go drinks. And maybe there's even a, a drive through on that side of the, uh, of the cafe. And you're that the focus on that side is quality, but even more than that is efficiency and speed. You've got your flavored lattes. They're still great. That's just kind of how we roll now. But really, it's taking our cafe is always both of our cafes are always pulled in this tension between these two concepts. So the whole idea is like, what if we could separate, do each concept justice in a sense, Mm. fully lean into the to go with the Eversys, fully lean into the for here education, third wave, that sort of thing, slow experience. And just let people sort of choose their journey in our coffee shop. Um, we've talked about that a good bit. And that's what I would do. Yeah, I think I'm pretty <clears throat> aligned there. It might be, I'll say two things. One, I'd be down to open a completely drive through operation with an, like a two Eversys group head situation. Uh, and then I'm also down to open what you're saying. I think similar, you know, if it has a drive-through, great. If not, like take our Dunwoody Cafe for reference. Like we, if we were going to do this concept there, like one of the corners of the space would just almost be like a different cafe in a way Mm -hmm. that has like a door front access. And then you can go in and out there to get your to-go drinks from Mm -hmm. the Eversys. And then the other part is the sit-in cafe and where you get your drinks on a more semi-auto espresso machine i like that idea i think it could be cool in the right place do you guys hear about onyx having a robot outside of their cafe that can make drinks 24 7 no like a vending machine yeah is it an eversys dude i think it's called bionics that's tight bionix for uh, onyx coffee are you kidding me whoa Come on. Uh, we, we, should, we should look into that one. <laughs> one robot, yes. please. That's kind of awesome. The coffee world is falling apart because DeLonghi purchased like a majority stake in La Marzocco or something of those sorts. Really? Yeah, and DeLonghi also owns Eversys. Wow. And they have made clear their plans to have the companies overlap. Wow. And all of these like home baristas and all the YouTube baristas and stuff are like losing their mind about the craft of coffee. Man, and I'm like, bring it on. Because you're still going to have the craft the craft and the semi-auto stuff. Yeah. But for us in a cafe experience, that just enables our baristas to do other things a that better, are really, really a, cool. A better looking Eversys in a cafe. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking about. Disguised I know that. as a linea. We're going to be straight up with you guys. Dude, like, <laughs> yes. Press a button. The reason we don't have an Eversys is because of the way they look. And yeah, they're pretty dang expensive too. And because of the price. But 
I would say when that changes, it's really going to change the conversation for us. And then even like what we recommend some of our wholesale partners out there. Yeah. And you know, a lot of times that, that type of machine would be perfect for something someone's starting up, but kind of hard to suggest when they look really ugly. Yeah. I mean, where my mind went was less of like La Marzocco machines, you know, getting more super auto, but I was like, no, the other way around. I yeah. want the Eversys machine to start looking more like mm-hmm. Estrada. Yeah, but- kind of a la Mavam. How Mavam has that super auto where it looks just like their normal machines. Mm. And you just press a button and espresso comes out. Hey, I'll just say something a little different. Uh, because that would be my that was my first thought, that that cafe concept. But maybe just going to Meadowlark and even the prompt of like if I received it as like if I was gonna do my own thing or something. I I kind of been uh, liking that like smaller one to two person espresso bar, very few seats in like a small downtown model where it's like everybody knows it's just like you come get the coffee, say what's up and you roll. Yeah. But that idea of like having like a roll up window or something where people could just kind of chill out at a bar and sit and get served and there's like eight seats or something. Yeah. Oppo Coffee Indicator, like across from Kimball House, they have a, I think they have like a service window outside. It's pretty cool. That is cool. Yeah, you need foot traffic for sure, but Decatur has good foot traffic. You'd say that. So that makes sense. Is Ross doing the wrong thing with his mic again? No, Ross is fine. No, I just, I was touching this as oh, okay. he was talking about. I just want to make sure I'm doing the right thing. <laughs> I'm, no, you're. No, you just want to make sure I'm, I'm doing the right. I'm thing. just holding my hands like this because I'm scared. All right, you got any more questions for us, Ross? Come on, pick Dude, on. I, I do, but um, I don't even want to turn this thing into a Q and A. I love Q and A. We can throw we can throw caution to the wind and throw out our other topic and just. Well, roll. we just have so much content to get to over these next weeks. I don't want to get backed up. I'm kidding. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I have several questions. All right, you're joking, but we really do. Here we go. You weren't in our content meeting yesterday. That's true. We came We're up with up. some really awesome ideas. They're gonna. I was still working, guys. I okay, was doing something else from Katie Corsi. Katie sent on February fifth. What's today? February seventh. Yeah, that's, 7th. 7th. Yeah, that's a good. Turn Were around. you done with Nathan Hanna? Well, he's got other questions that we can come back to later. <laughs> uh, that was a high five. My name is Katie, and <laughs> hey, Katie. <laughs> Hello, Katie. Katie. I am a huge fan of your podcast. Oh, awesome. I would love to hear you guys talk about how to know who you should go into business with. Oh, Oh, I think we already (laughs) talked about this. What values should align? How many people is too many? How long of a commitment should people be willing to make? Whoa. Okay. Let's go there. I think we all have something to say. And Ethan, I'd like you to go first. Okay. Why does Ethan always get to go first? I'm, he literally doesn't. My name is in alphabetical order. So there you go. Um, Everyone's um, name is in alphabetical order, bro. Well, mine's first okay. in the order. Mine, I'm just saying, you said it's in alphabetical order. Dude. Everybody's name is a part of the alphabet. Okay. I'm going to pound on the first you, letter. Bro. Wait till the can camera we, is closed. Can we and I'm stop gonna, this right now, please? I don't want to do this anymore. <laughs> I don't want to be oh, whatever. Let's make a unanimous decision right to now. To keep going. To keep okay. going. Yeah. Um, dude, I forgot the questions already. Okay. What values should align? How do you know to who to who to go into business with? How many people's too many? How long of a commitment should people be willing to make? My first thought with that was you gotta have a line vision on what you're building. Do you think she's speaking specifically in coffee or should we just I think so. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's pretty huge. Uh, because if the three of us started a business together and we had different vision on how we wanted to grow, like a ton of people would not want to be where we are right now. And a ton of people would either want to be way bigger or way smaller. You know what I mean? But like finding the vision of how and how fast you want to grow your company. Um, and that would directly influence how many owners I would say or like partners should be a part of because if you're having one thing, like one cafe, I think we would all be like, you should really just try to do it yourself. We should plug in numbers on the cafe viability spreadsheet of the three of us on one cafe. If we just like worked behind the bar all the time. That that episode's coming soon. How much, how much you can make as a coffee shop owner. We're going to expose our salaries. 
Oh, uh, so so much, dude. Yeah, your the values alignment is legit. I mean, I feel like talking about it would be very helpful. I don't know how you would, if you do like a little like heart search together and what do you care about? What are your what are the things you value? But the the values and how they hit different skill sets though is interesting because you don't want like a carbon copy of yourself. Well, so let's dissect this a little bit. When we were starting, okay, what were what were the shared values that we had at that point? I know that we Coffee. you know we have we have five core values now, right? And we didn't have any of those named at that point. Like I said earlier, we didn't really know what we wanted because we were really young. And we sort of grew up together, like I said. But uh, what were the shared values, even in their most basic form at that point? Mm. Excellence. Mm -hmm. I think, yeah, that's definitely one. Like we, one, like we wanted to do coffee and we wanted it to be really, really good coffee. Uh, that sounds basic, but that's a really different business model. If you want to do really good coffee, you're going to pay more for coffee, pay more for milk, pay more for your products. And you're going to make different decisions. You're going to buy different espresso machines. You're going to, that's all a huge part of it. So really good coffee. Was there anything else? I mean, if we're talking about when we first, first, first started, that was it. We, I, we may have had a, a tinge of like respect. Like we, I think we were always, a good word. we always gave really respectful service. Mm -hmm. We weren't, we were not very like loose. We were kind of like rigid with our service, but it mm -hmm. was, it was out of like a place of, honor and respect for the beverage we were serving, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And then over time, as we, and I was telling someone this recently, you are going to find out your core values by doing your business. Whoa. So, so that, Dude. that okay, is sort of the real, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, full stop. Baby. Uh, that is sort of pushing against this question a little bit because she's asking, how do I know that the people I'm going into business with have shared values? And I'm over here like, yeah, try your best. Do as much as you can to ensure that. Make sure you like more or less see the world the same way, even just worldview wise, I think goes a long way. Mm. Um, but you're going to figure out your specific values. You're going to evolve into the company that you want to be by operating. And I was telling someone like, those early days when we would do an event every two months or whatever. And then in between events, we would just like sit around the kitchen table and talk about what we wanted to be and how we were going to drum up business. That was such an amorphous time and season for us where we were just like kind of wandering in the dark a little bit, but trying as hard as we can mm -hmm. could. And then when we got the Georgia tech farmer's market pop-up where we would uh, serve for, I think it was for four hours outside Georgia Tech students. I, I just remember that feeling of us behind the bar serving people. And I heard the way that you serve people. I heard the way that you serve people and it influenced how I serve people. And we started to like form this brand identity beyond just the coffee, just out of our own personality and giftings. So there was like this base alignment that like worldview wise, we kind of have had similar beliefs and we wanted really good coffee, but everything else came just from doing it. So that kind of is like not answering the question, but it is a part of the we're landscape. We're a pretty bad example of like doing a smart, making a smart decision. It's We're lucky. We're blessed for sure. Yeah. That's yeah. Good. To answer the question, how many, I'm like, Maybe why are you answering this question? I, I, or asking this question, are, is it just because you have like a group of friends who all talked about opening a coffee company? Mm. Uh, because just if you're talking about opening a business with four, five, six people, it's just, and then that question leading into the, uh, the question of how long should the commitment be? Mm. You shouldn't, if you're starting a business with someone, you should not be thinking about your exit? The exit. Unless that is your goal of the company, to sell the company. Then switch industries. But I wouldn't, you know, if I was starting a coffee company and Ethan was like, yeah, you got me for two years, I, I just wouldn't start the company with him. Yeah, that's legit. 
Yeah, and I think to zoom in on that a little bit, it's less about duration in time and more about what what purpose or function is this pursuit and endeavor serving in your life. Yeah. Because for us, it was like, we want to make this our career because we love coffee. But that may not always be the case. There's not one right answer. But being aligned on that, I think, is really important. If you're talking about starting a business with someone who's only going to give you a short-term commitment, at that point, I'm like, why would you even start the business with them? Why wouldn't you go out and search for an equity investor who's going to actually bring the thing you really need up front, money to the table, to where you can like grow a lot faster? Totally. That's good. That's good. Thanks for the question, Katie. Obviously, you want your equity investor to be values aligned as well. You don't want to give up all the control of your company, but that's just yeah. kind of what comes to mind. I've got one. Yeah. Uh, Circle Coffee. What's up, Circle Coffee? Hey. Asks, what machine do you use for frozen slash slushy drinks? Does it work well or has it been a dud? Are you able to get the <laughs> drinks within your standards with the amount of sugar required for freezing? Dude, holy crap. This Great is a good question. question. Mm-hmm. Well, we have little experience. We just like went for it last summer. We bought a um, a Vever, Vever, V E V O R. So cheap, eight hundred dollar one. Um, I don't think I've ever heard a good thing about a slushy mas- machine. Agreed. So maybe I'm sure the multi thousand dollar ones are better in ways. We had some like really goofy problems about like when it would freeze too quickly. Um, since the, uh, like hopper was mounted by like tension, it notoriously would pop off and that's a bad mess. Yeah. We we're still have, we've got scars in Alpharetta from that. So you're still just like step in a certain place and you're like, that's a little sticky, but <laughs> I'll say like, it's kind of like a, it's finicky, but you can make it work. You know, if you find your recipe so we did a black cold brew one and it was, I mean, it was darn sweet. Yeah. It was like, this is a little uncomfortable to drink black. And then I mixed like cream or just oat milk and then put the slushy over it. And I was like, this is divine. Mm-hmm. Uh, so hit that real quick with the, the sugar content. Oh uh, yeah. I forget what the number is. I don't know if it was like 13%, but like, I think that's it. A decently high percentage of the liquid needs to be sugar so it stays slushy, not ice. You can't just put water in there and it turn into slushy. Yeah. Or coffee. Yeah. And I think liquor helps. And that's why like frozen margaritas probably do have a lot of sugar too, but the alcohol is a good like bitter offset. You probably wouldn't even have to do sugar with booze, right? Well, you you especially would because alcohol doesn't freeze. You're saying sugar helps it. Yeah, sugar helps it freeze. It's like okay, it's like, you know, a, like crystallize almost. Yeah, because mm. it alcohol would never even get to that point. Mm. So, but when you don't have such a like a strong flavor like alcohol, and you're doing like non-alcoholic uh, mixtures, it does tend to be really sweet. Because um, we did like a, a no hito, like a mojito take with apple cider vinegar. And it was, some days it was awesome. And I was like, some days I was like, this is intense. Yeah. This is a tough drink. Hey, I dropped some rum in that one time though. And, and it was, <laughs> it, that to that point, like that's the reason why. I didn't drop it in the slushy machine. I dropped it in my <laughs> cup. Friday afternoon, yeah. you're like, all right, guys, let's treat our guests right. Like you said, alcohol is such a good contrast to sugar and acid. Yeah. And so we tried to sub that alcohol for like a shrub type vibe, apple cider vinegar. The acid goes way up. But that's really acidic. Yeah. So it like kind of acts as the alcohol in some sense because it's quote unquote hot. It's how I would describe alcohol in a drink. But the the balance swings way too acidic for uh for drinks like that. So it sucks because we really wanted to make it work and do it like every summer. But I think we're gonna I think we're we're 86ing the slushy machines. Yeah, we kept one because it's like it was getting consistent. Like, you know, you replace a gasket or two, you kind of figure out your temp zones, and you're like, I think in specifically in Dunwoody, we like didn't really have problems. Mm-hmm. There was never like a big spill. There was like a gasket leak one time. It was like, okay, this this works. Those were also used a lot less. It was it was far less popular. A little there. less wear and tear for sure. 
But I'm sure if we like found a drink we were super hype on, maybe. But it is a it's a pretty high value add. I get it. Um, but we sold one for for cheap to a guy who wanted to do like frozen lemonade for kids. And I was like, this could be perfect. Mm. Shout out Mountain Perk. Next question. Thanks, Circle Coffee. So Alyssa from Pascal's Coffee. Pascal. Shout out Alyssa. She bought my she bought my ode. Oh man. Dude, she's, yeah. she's connected, yo. Awesome. So uh Alyssa's part of the Pascal's team. Uh and she was saying that like after their when they came to our warehouse and what did you guys talk about? Oh man. Uh everything but coffee. <laughs> everything else about <laughs> they, coffee. They business. had some great coffee questions. Uh yeah, it was like a culture, hospitality. Like I was kind of walking them through our core values and service philosophies. Yeah. And we had some really similar like values and we were, we were going hard. Um, yeah. Which is something that by, this is a little ad read here, but something that we absolutely love to do, especially for so wholesale high. partners in the Southeast that can handle a day trip to North Atlanta. We're about 30, 40 minutes North of Atlanta without traffic, but that's never, <laughs> <laughs> um, just sitting down in our conference room and fully opening up our book and just being able to talk about anything, any experience that we've learned. We really try to be generous with information on this program, but what you miss on the program is like us being able to apply that information to your specific situation. Not that we're claiming all to having, have all the answers and the yeah. one-stop shop way to have a successful coffee business. but we get to lean on each other as leaders in the coffee industry and share our experiences, which makes us better together. So that's one of the things we love to do in our wholesale program. So she came in and did that here with the Pascal's crew. And uh, she had some questions after that. And it's about coffee. Hey, what's the best method for changing grind size on espresso or other brewing devices? I don't want to go finer. But sometimes it feels like I have no choice. Crying emoji. Whoa. Why do you think she doesn't want to go finer? And why do you think she feels like she needs to go finer? If you could speculate. Rick, dude, I was going to ask you the same thing. Do you, do you have a gut? Yeah, well, it's, it probably uh, that you feel like the coffee is under extracted. Yep. And um, you might think that like when, when we dial in espresso, especially with, with people that don't typically drink espresso, usually the main thing they say is it tastes sour. Mm. And, there, you know, go back to one of our last podcast episodes about extraction, over and under extraction. One of the key takeaways that I, I really enjoyed there from doing that research was that I dare you to try to over extract your coffee. Because mm -hmm. it's going to be hard to do. Because channeling happens, especially in espresso, the finer that you go. Mm -hmm. And so that's probably why she's saying, like, I don't want to go finer. And also the grinder, if it's not a great grinder, if it's not cleaned well and maintained, it will get clumpy. Mm -hmm. And so the finer you go, the more clumpy the, the and really just the quality of the grind, I feel like goes down the finer it, that it is. I feel like just if you were to, uh, what's the, is a Kruv sifter? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it is a device that kind of like measures grind size. If you were to do a test on finer coffee versus coarser coffee, I just feel like it's easier to grind coarser coffee because it's working not as hard. I don't know. That's just theory. Yeah. I mean, I guess your burr set is a lot of, of that. How like unimodal your burrs are. But just take like, whatever grinder you think Pascal's has in their coffee shop or like whatever espresso grinder that's been used for three years by and large experientially. And that that's one thing about this podcast, everybody is that we are usually going to speak from our experience, mm -hmm. which is the most strong thing you can offer. Mm -hmm. And our experience is dealing with the commercial. They have Simonelli's by the way. Good to know. Commercial cafe, professional barista setting. And we love home baristas. We love that culture. And it's like, it's not something that I personally, I just have a bun coffee maker at home. 
but yeah, our it's industry, a, it's a cool one though. Our, thank you. Our industry would not go around without home baristas, but I'll just say, we're always going to speak more on that side of like commercial <laughs> side. So like a normal commercial coffee espresso grinder, I feel like it's going to grind better course. That's probably why she's saying I, I don't want to go finer. Um, one thing you can do is increase the yield by three grams to increase extraction. Mm-hmm. So let's lay out a little quick hypothetical. Let's say you pull a shot of espresso, 18 grams in, 40 grams out. It took 25 seconds. It tasted mostly good, but whenever you first took the sip, it was kind of sour, salty, a little shocking, lack sweetness. And the finish was sort of non-existent or maybe salty. And you're like, okay, this is under extracted. I could go finer, but I've already been finer three times and I don't want to do that anymore. Just add three grams of yield. So 18 grams in, 43 grams out, or even 45 grams out. And you might say, well, doesn't that water it down? Yes. You are losing strength. More water passes through the puck, which is going to, uh, in, in theory, give you less body on that shot of espresso. But in function and in, in like actual like tasting it, I usually don't notice a huge change in body when I add or subtract yield. Mm. And so that's a really quick way to increase extraction without decreasing grind size. Dude, what's a really another interesting way that I just get in my head about all the time? Sorry, this is kind of my Q&A. Sorry, <laughs> hijacking it, Alyssa. Oops. What do you guys think about when you're in that scenario about upping the dose? Because you kind of have two things happening at the same time. You're creating more work for the water to get through the coffee, which usually reflects in it taking more time. Mm-hmm. Like an up dose typically increases the time. But because there's more coffee, you're also lowering your overall extraction. Mm -hmm. So do you think it's like a net neutral result in general? You're not changing two variables. You're changing three variables. Time. What were the two you just said? You're changing your dose. Dose. Then that will reflect in the time. Time. As well as, no, I guess that's Any variable you change is going to change time. It's just, it's just always. Well, time is not a variable. Time is more byproduct. Well, (laughs) here's what I was going to say is when you change what, uh, to zoom out for a second, scientific method, high school style. When we dial an espresso or when we're solving a problem, let's change one variable at a time if possible so that we can dissect the impact of that change on the result. Mm -hmm. If you change two variables, then you won't know why you ended up at the result that you ended up at. So when you change dose, you're not only changing the dose, you're also changing the distance between the top of the puck and the bottom of the dispersion screen, the headroom. And I think that affects affects extraction. And so what we have landed on here and in our company is keep dose the same. Use two grams less than the size of your portafilter basket. So we use 20 gram BSD baskets here. This is what we're, we're working with. and if, if I have new opinions there. It's always up for debate because that's innovation. But 18 grams, if you're using a 20-gram basket, that's a good amount of headroom, allegedly. And uh, change the yield because that only changes one variable at a time. Mm-hmm. That's what I would say to that. I do not change my dose ever. I pick a number according to my basket. I do the same amount of coffee as the size of the pour filter basket. Mm. Uh, I would be willing to go and prove this point right now. But I think if I grabbed an 18 gram VST basket and I did 18 grams in it, it would be the perfect amount of headroom. I mean, that makes sense because that's what the number that's on it. Yeah. I think, but. I think 20 to 18 with 20 is too much uh, headroom. We should and do some testing. And it's just we like should. chaos in there. Yeah, and maybe the puck can get sucked up more channeling around. Yeah, I think it. some other other geniuses out there have a like I'm being serious when I say genius, that sounded very sarcastic. Uh have <laughs> have more videos about what that does for extraction, but uh I think that having too much or too little headroom is going to cause the, the issues. And I did a test like a couple days ago on 18 grams in an 18 gram basket and it was like it looked visually perfect. Yeah. Here's one thing you really want to avoid. 
the bottom of the dispersion screen and the little screw that goes through the screen touching your coffee puck, especially when that coffee puck is dry. Mm-hmm. That means you have too much coffee in your basket. Yeah. And that like having this bottomless port filter around has really showed me how possible and probable channeling is. And so if you have anything touching that coffee puck, especially a screw, yeah. it's going to channel immediately. Something just to get back to Alyssa's original question was if you talking about channeling, if you keep finding the grind, you're just also increasing the likelihood that you're going to channel your shot. And I think we all know that frustration of like you keep tightening up and you're, then you keep tasting it and you're like, this tastes terrible mm. because you're tasting uneven extraction. You're getting over extraction in some areas and then under extraction in the others. So I think we talked about that a lot in one of the extraction podcasts about like really working on technique to ensuring you're not channeling anything. I would also be interested to know there's so many variables. Oh, Right before we sold the Strata, I pulled shots using VST versus non-VST baskets because VST are higher flow baskets because they have more holes. And the exact same shot, like ground the same way, completely different times. Mm -hmm. So if you want to be able to grind finer, which I think you want to be able to grind as fine as you can before you channel. You want to be able to grind finer. uh, A lot of it depends on the basket you use. So I would go for a more high flow basket. Have you guys seen these like Swarks designs or Weber workshops, newer baskets that are? A little bit. They have holes that reach all the way to the edge. Mm -hmm. Which makes sense. Yeah, like it's, it makes a ton of sense. You can also get a, away with, instead of doing that, you can just use a paper filter at the bottom on any basket, and it's going to change. Like, I bet you if I pulled a shot with two different baskets, uh, paper filter on the bottom, they would, be, they would be a lot more similar because the paper filter helps saturate the basket to the edges. Yeah. So uh, it kind of does the same thing, but those baskets with the holes all the way to the edge, like the flow, like the shots look crazy if you're using a bottomless port filter. They don't look very good, but the extraction yield is amazing. Mm. Wow. Yeah, really the theme here is relying less on the grinder to be your end-all, be-all, you know, six key to success with extraction and really being as thorough as you possibly can with your technique. And another part of that is WDT. Like if, if your shot, if your if your puck is really clumpy, then again, you know, puck integrity is going to go down because those clumps are going to have greater density than not clumps. Um, let's move on. Another question. Might be the last one before we review this coffee. Oh, yeah. People have lots of questions about training. Ooh. And uh, so do we. <laughs> so do, do we. Do we have any answers? Oh, yeah. Again, we can speak from our experience. Um eh. Oh, well, let me read the question. Ah. <laughs> training, where to begin? <laughs> How much inline training do you do? I would think inline means like in the behind, cafe, behind the bar, over the shoulder type <laughs> stuff like that. Once an employee is, quote, up to speed, end quote, how do you go back and reinforce? So there's two questions there. Maybe we could just sort of like, as of right now, talk about our training philosophy and method Mm -hmm. when taking someone who has never worked behind the bar before to like they can operate every position in Mm. our cafe you know even if that's a a long journey in days and months but you know what what's our general uh method there and then after that we'll hit the how do you go back and reinforce that initial training Ethan. (laughs) <laughs> great question man great question well we usually a lot like two business weeks for someone's onboarding um day one is like culture orientation paperwork getting the lay of the land maybe even laying out what training is going to look like getting expectations ready um and the expectation is hey we're going to work through all of these different um positions we've built out in the cafe And the training is going to be oriented to you succeeding in those positions. And there's going to be a lot of how in the beginning. 
and we're going to try to match with as much why as we can. But the most important thing is that you learn like how to do it and some deep fundamental whys of coffee, you know, and some people learn by doing a lot more and some people are a lot more heady and just want to talk. So doing like some flexibility and like maybe if someone learns a lot more by like deeper understanding, we'll have more time in the lab and be like, this is what's happening when the espresso is happening or like being made versus like, yep, just 18. You got to make sure it's even. And then they do it and they're like, Oh yeah, I think I got it. And then you can work from there. But, um, yeah, it is an interesting window, right? Because this is just a backup a second, but usually you're, we were talking about this just earlier, but you're training and hiring someone because you're probably short staffed. So there's like this, can we, can we get them on the bar? Can we get them ready to roll? But it's like, how do we make sure they're as ready as they'll be? But also, I don't know how you guys out there do your training, but it's like, we don't have them pull from the tips until they've like, they're a piece of the program, you know? So they're just making their flat hourly. And so no one wants to do that forever. So it's like, how do we know all that, but also make sure that we've give, given them enough time and like shadowing to, uh, to get the ropes. So I would say probably like 20 to 30% is like bar lab time, like away from the bar. So that would probably be two to three days of being here. And then probably six to seven days of, um, being shadowed and shadowing the team in action in the space. Because the reality is they are being, by the end of the two weeks, they just need to operate, know our menu and operate concierge. They need to know how to make espresso um, so they can be brewer. And then they need to just understand the layout of the space and the bar flow so that they can be a good like bar back support. They're not jumping into the like drink creation, latte art, expo realm and that saves us a lot of uh time there but what you're saying point number two is like how do you maybe continue to push them is a big part of that as well and i think that's where we've um that's where we're trying to grow is like what does it look like after the training to just continue to make these mile markers and these um milestones so that someone can keep growing with that almost on like a rapid pace that unfortunately we've left a lot up to the hunger level of that employee, right? Like if someone's really into coffee and like really wants to grow, we can like give them some things to chew on, but um, yeah, doing better about continuing to push. And that's where just day-to-day feedback, head coaches, leadership come in of like every day being like, this is how I want to get better today. Having a play of the day, having like a post shift debrief with your team of how, how was working with me? How could I have been better? What was working? What was not working? That's kind of like the battleground for that, like continue to reinforce and having a clear message from your like overall company of we want to have consistency. We want to do things the same way. And that really helps prevent a lot of people from just finding like their way of doing things, you know, and that being a perpetual path that everybody starts to veer off from. But if we are always fighting for consistency. That means that we're going to be talking about the way that we tamp or the way that we steam milk or the recipes we use in the drinks. Um, and that is awesome. I, last point on that. I think these post shift debriefs, I don't, I don't really know how often they happen, but I know that when they do, it is valuable for so many reasons. It's electric because I, I heard someone say early on that, like the the number one definer of your culture and excellence will be how much you allow. So like if somebody's doing a wrong thing that you train them not to do, then if you allow that to happen, then first of all, they're trying to do better because the boss is there. Yep. So imagine what they're doing when the boss isn't there. And then imagine the example that's setting for the other people when you're not there. Mm -hmm. And so being able to confront those things and course correct them in a non punish. Yeah. Yeah. Like, (laughs) yeah. Make them atone for what they did. (laughs) 
in, in a way that's respectful to them in a way that doesn't put them out is great. But the really cool thing about post shift debriefs is it's a recurring system that forces you to give feedback on a peer to peer level, which is so, so crucial. Yes. Because we don't want our team to just be robots that follow the mar- the barking orders of the person at the top. Mm-hmm. We want them to be self-sustained, which is what culture is. Like the culture is pushing forward when you're not there. Mm-hmm. And so post-shift debriefs, peer-to-peer feedback, flexing that muscle, normalizing feedback, making it just a normal part of the workday that you get that a peer is giving feedback to another peer is everything. It's goaded. It's goaded. Honestly. It's coded too. Speaking of goaded. Okay. Okay. I All have right. a feeling this is going to score kind of high. JP, thank you for sending us this coffee. Little Wolf, Ecuador, Angamaza. And Did we've had that? Melissa of Little Wolf on the program before. Yes. And we, we, we went there on our owner's retreat yes. to Portland, Maine. Yes. It was All awesome. Right. I loved being in there, man. It was electric. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, bag notes, key lime, amaretto, tart. I would agree. That was gutsy to call it tart, but it's literally it literally tart in the best way. If key lime isn't tart, I don't know. My what name, what's tart? My name isn't Thomas. And it is. <laughs> and it is. Uh, process, washed, elevation, 2,080 meters. It's kind of high, yeah? Yeah. It's giving yeah. high. Yeah. Uh, varietals, Katura, Tipica, Mejorado, Me- Mejorado, Mejorado, Cidra, uh, Katu Kai. I saw that one. I was like, oh, I don't know how to say that. I haven't seen that. We've got some things to learn. I think we have found a new varietal. <laughs> uh, fun illustrations on the back. Good coffee and companions. Wow. There you go. Coffee is meant to be enjoyed. We source only the highest quality coffee and roast it with care, but believe a cup truly can only be as good as the company you share it with. So grab some friends, furry or not, and brew it just the way you like it. For best results, grind fresh, share, and enjoy within three weeks. It's good copy. Interesting. I would disagree, Little Wolf. I would disagree. (laughs) Go get it. About the three weeks. LittleWolfCoffee.com. About the three weeks. (laughs) That, uh, uh, the other stuff is good. I disagree about the three weeks part. Uh, it has been more than three weeks in this coffee. H- how would you say it's progressed from the first time you tried it? It has been exactly the same. Cool. It's only been awesome the whole time. Awesome. I had it 10 days off roast and then 20 some odd days off roast. And- mm-hmm. Unmatched. I just don't get how a washed coffee can taste like this. A I don't think it's. I don't Ecuador. think it's street legal, man. I think it's not. Street I think they legal. got this on and the then, black market. And then also the five varieties in it is also just such a mystery to me. So, I'm not as I'm not as freaked out by that as you are. I think I, a lot. I see that. I think a lot of times people just put multiple in the varietal category, sure. and that's just one word. But it could mean. But the one word means many, mi- many oh. words. Never yeah. mind. Yeah, this coffee good. is so not expensive, too. It's also eight ounces of coffee. I know, but it's nineteen fifty for eight eight ounces of this coffee. I, I think I'm gonna. I might buy a kilo of this coffee for my house because it's that good. Can we get a wholesale? I'm kidding. It's for your house, dude. Uh, this dude. This is a deep cut, and we can totally go there later. But like, this coffee makes me want to like sell other people's co- like show off other people's coffee yeah sometimes yeah you want to read more about the coffee really quick sure uh finca lugma pata is a family run operation located in a place in ecuador situated between meters above sea level they grow several different variety varietals including a lot of varietals in 2012, the first 20,000 trees were planted, and by 2022, they expected to have well over 50,000 coffee trees planted. Whoa. Expect to have. In their first year of production in 2016, they achieved third place in Taza Dorada, and in their second year of production in 2017, they achieved first place. 
Due to their meticulous operation, including selecting only the ripest cherries, double wash and cherry to ensure consistency in the fermentation process, various fermentation experiments, taking great care in the washing and drying and proper storage of the coffee post-drying, these achievements are no surprise. In addition, the social com- component of the farm is really what makes them stand out in order to help improve the lives of those living in and around Palatanga. They prepared in their nursery new trees of primarily Bourbon Cedra, which were slash are destined for new coffee growers in the area. The idea is to teach them how to produce high quality coffees, create sustainable businesses, and improve their livelihoods. I mean, they, nothing here told me why this coffee is a freak show other than they're just really good. They're doing a good job. Yeah. <laughs> and it's true. Keep up the good work, guys. I would recommend people to go buy this coffee. And also, Little Wolf, who's your importer on this? Uh, I know. It's Coffee Quest. Sourced by Coffee Quest. Nice. Oh. So, <laughs> sorry, Little Wolf, we're going to head off Coffee Quest. Because it's good. Yeah. Uh, what do you guys think of the bag? That's our first order of business. Could I just start by saying that we have really tried to st- strike a balance over the years with like, quote, fun illustrations and uh, clean design that is timeless. And they did that by putting a clean, timeless design on the front and, quote, fun illustrations on the back. But and they're not the sides, too fun. You know what I mean? I, I, that's not the right word. They are, they are very fun. They're extremely whimsical. They're so, it's, it's line arty. It's, it's very, very clean and on brand with their type. And it doesn't take away from the copy on the bag mm-hmm. or the coffee in Ooh, the bag. We've said that so many times. It's true. And then on the inside of the bag, what do you got? You got some... Some little lines. Some little textures. It looks like hair. Yeah. Ew. Like an- Ew. animal Ugh. hair. That is true. Which is kind of gross. But <laughs> I'm going to have to downgrade my score. <laughs> well, I, they have some stuff on the sides as well. Uh huh. Okay. Content out of 10. One, two, three. 10. Eight. 10 on content. What else would you want? Dude, I don't QR know. QR code. QR code. All right. You're right. You're right. <laughs> Nine. Maybe a blurb about the coffee. He had to look it up. I mean, it's awesome, but come on, 10, 2, 8. <laughs> Ethan's mad. Yeah. I mean, like, what's, your, what's your new score? 9? Eight. Eight? 8. Oh, my gosh. Okay. Dude, well, why an 8? What's going on? Yeah, dude. What's up with you? All right. Aesthetic out of 10. 1, 2, 3, eight. 9. 8? What is <laughs> up with you, dude? You hate it? I Melissa's like a good person. <laughs> <laughs> All right, user experience, Ethan. Oh my gosh, dude. Can I say this about user experience? No. JP McKenzie gives me the back. He's like, I want you to make this on your guy's getaway. I was like, I didn't bring a grinder. He gets a mason jar. He's like, how much do you usually dose out for your Bonavita? I was like, 60 grams. Doses me out 60 grams, grinds it, seals it up, writes what it is, a little note. Gives me that and the bag. Talk about wow. user experience. <laughs> you didn't so, even have to open it. So the point That's is, ultimate you user don't know. experience. <laughs> so the point is, he's a great guy. We're right. gonna we're gonna give it a four. It's it's got a zipper. It's got a zipper. Nothing tears. Nothing gets broken. Yeah. Yep. Four. Bag, bag's a little crinkly now. Awesome flavor of this coffee. Ten. It's a ten. It's, it's a ten. ten. It's, I, it's I don't know literally how a ten. We can do that. It makes me a little uncomfortable. I kind of want to give it a nine and a half. I'm going to say nine. I'm going to bring it down to nine and a half. <laughs> so there's room to grow. Yeah, fine. I mean, it is just, it is really an impressive coffee. It is. JP told you it was in his top five. I would, it's in my top five. For sure. Yeah. Just, I, di- dibs. Nope. Just because it, it is a washed coffee from Ecuador. That really factors in for me. That's awesome. Enjoyability, 10. 10. Yeah. I'm going to go 10 on enjoyability. Uh Uh-oh. I'm excited. Oh, the crunch. Uh This might really tank their score. Uh, That's true. Got to get all these different varieties. Do you guys remember what roaster they roast on? Probat. 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 Okay. Probat. Probat. It's on the side of their bag. Kind of. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Just a roaster. That's smiling? Yeah. That crunch tastes exactly like the coffee yeah let's go you don't get to say what our score is 
No, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to say what the score is. I'm just kidding. All right. One, two, three, four. four. Dialed. I could have said what the score was. Yeah, I would have been right. It's true. It's true. Check this out. Yo. Dude, bottle flips. So cool. That was another high five. Do you guys know any jokes? Do you think their department of agriculture makes them say ingredients whole bean coffee? Yeah. I think so. All right. 44. Out of 50? Yeah. What did free throw get? <laughs> 42, I think. 42.5. We, 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 we have to compile a leaderboard soon. Rig. That we can show. But this is either number one or tied. Probably tied up with freed hats. Yeah. I think it was similar ballpark. 44. Man. And I stand by. Both of those coffees are insane. Yeah. You had those on your coffee menu? You'd be, you'd be you just wild. might change the way people perceive <laughs> You can make a ton of money. <laughs> and tune in next week for how to make a ton of money. Yeah. We're Actually, uh, that. literally, that's kind of what we're going to talk about. Right? We're going to talk about how much you can make as a coffee shop owner. Yes, we are. I'm excited for that. We're going to disclose how much we make as coffee shop owners, coners, and uh, yeah, plug that into the viability spreadsheet. Mm -hmm. All right. This has been an awesome time with you both. The coffee's been good. The content's been good. The conversation's been good. (laughs) Guys, have a great week. Love you.